to be anywhere in Michigan, and you chose to be here, and so we're grateful for that. Uh, God is so good to us. Uh, we're so grateful even that He's moving in hearts still and changing lives still. I thank you for all the, I'm very thankful for all the people that volunteer so much of their time and effort to even pull off a service like this. It's a, it's a wonderful testimony to God's grace. I'd like to pray and then ask God to bless our time together, if you don't mind. Father, we're thankful. We are so grateful for who you are. We praise you that you are the holy God of the universe, that there's none like you. That by the very word of your mouth, by your own power, you called into existence the world around us, the universe, and all that is in the universe. And we thank you for your creativity. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for how you have provided for us day in and day out, even though we are so undeserving. God, you are so kind to us. But Lord, there's no greater provision that we can understand than Jesus Christ. And you've provided Christ for us so that we might have the opportunity, the hope of eternal life. And Lord, there are so many things that are distracting us from the reality, the truth uh, of Christ. And so even now, for this time together, may we press out all of those things that would so easily distract us from the purpose that we're here today is to hear a word from God. And that when we hear this word from God, it might transform our thinking and that we might become more and more like your son. And so, Father, thank you for the privilege that we have to come and sit under the preaching of your word. I pray that you would fill me even now with your spirit, that you would enable me to speak your truth in a way that's pleasing to you. And, Lord, I pray that you would fill everyone here with your spirit, uh, that they would hear what it is you have for them to hear. Uh, we thank you for the powerful word of God and how it changes lives. But, Lord, may we be doers of what we hear, not just hearers only. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. If, uh, if you were to take a poll asking this particular question, um, how does a person get into heaven, what do you suppose the result would be? What kind of answers would you receive with that kind of a question? I think, I believe that you would hear something like, getting into heaven requires being a good person. I mean, I'm talking about the vast majority of people. If they, in fact, believe in heaven, they would think that there is something they must do to achieve uh, entrance into that heaven. I, I, I also believe that you would get a similar answer outside of our own country, but even in the countries and cultures around the world, uh, whether it be Nepal in a Hindu temple or a Buddhist monk taking a vow of poverty, prayer, and daily rituals as they serve in a Buddhist temple. Or Muslims who say that their creed, uh, they, they must say their creed, they must pray at prescribed times of the day, five times each day. They must give alms, they must observe the fast of Ramadan, they must make pilgrimages to Mecca, and to perform other types of rituals. All of this with the hope that Allah would have mercy on them because of what they have done for Him. Cults. Uh, cults. That might, uh, all the cults that we understand are cultic, uh, are of a works based mindset as well. The way to heaven, the way to paradise, is through good works. It may require knocking on doors or sharing your faith or going on a two year mission or tithing your money or abstaining from particular foods or drinks and other duties uh, like that. And so cults will manipulate what the gospel says and list out all these things that one must do to obtain eternal life. But that's not just limited to cultic mindset. It's also found in Christian circles, religious circles. Many Christian religions think that they can earn right standing before God by going to Mass or going to confession or doing good works or, or even some harsh treatment of their bodies. You see a picture on the screen where people are literally beating themselves with whips in order to gain some merit with God, somehow ingratiating themselves with God. Martin Luther was a classic example. He gave up a career in law to join a monastery where he devoted himself to prayer and fasting, 
penance and the confession of sins to the place where he was confessing his sins so much that his, his uh, leader was saying, all right, Martin, enough. But he just kept doing these things because he realized how, how much needed to be done in order to have the promise of eternal life. Living, life, living a life of self-imposed harsh conditions. He was trying to earn his salvation by works. But he could not find peace with God because he knew that all of his works were in fact tainted by sin. Wouldn't it be the most terrible tragedy to devote one's life to the service of God only to find out when you stand before God that you got it all wrong and that now you are facing eternal wrath? Wouldn't that be a terrible tragedy? How is it that the man on the cross that was by Jesus when Jesus was crucified, how is it the man on the cross was ushered into heaven on that day after hanging on the cross with Jesus? And those who work so hard, so diligently over the course of their life will be cast into the lake of fire. How is that? Matthew chapter 7, probably one of the most chilling verses in the Bible say, says this. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? You see this? These people are doing religious activities, religious things. And look at Jesus' response. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. That ought to make us a little uncomfortable, folks, especially those of us that have been raised in the church. And we, we just think that because we go to church every week that somehow God's going to check off the box that says, look, well, that's good. You did what you're supposed to do. You're in. That's not what the Bible teaches. That's not what God has to say. Friends, this life is short, and eternity, well, is eternal. It doesn't stop. We can't even get our minds around the concept of eternity. So, we might want to get this right. We might want to have a clear understanding of how it is that you and I can be right with God. We're coming to the end of our Romans 9 chapter. This is the last sermon out of Romans 9. And Paul is again challenging the religious to get it right the religious, the Jews, to get it right. Listen, if the Bible is correct, and it is, you and I should genuinely listen to what it has revealed regarding salvation from God's eternal and holy wrath. Paul is planning to set this straight in these verses that we're going to cover today. And the main thought that I want you to have today as we look through this text is God's work, not your work, makes you right with Him. God's work, not your work, makes you right with Him. The first thing that I want you to see is this out of verses 30 and 31. Be right with God by faith. Be right with God by faith. Look at the text. Paul says these words, What shall we say then, that Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it? That is, a righteousness that is by faith. But that Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness, did not succeed in reaching that law. So Paul starts these verses off with a question, what shall we say then? Well, this this phrase brings a close to the discussion in this chapter and the idea that Paul has been addressing, which is this. If God is faithful to His covenant promises to His chosen people, then why are most of the Jews rejecting Jesus as their Messiah and Lord? I think that's a great question. Why are the vast majority of Jews rejecting the Christ, rejecting the long prophesied Messiah as indeed the King of kings and the Lord of lords? So Paul is saying, what shall we say then? And as we learned last week, God's intention was never to save all the Jews, but instead a remnant of the Jews, a portion 
of the Jews. Now, let me remind you of this very important truth this morning. No one deserves salvation. If you're sitting here today and you think, you know what, I'm a pretty good dude, or God's really, really fortunate to have me on his team, let me tell you, this is not what the Bible teaches. And I would be remiss to not challenge that thought. Um, the Jews did not deserve salvation. The Gentiles did not, do not deserve salvation. You, me, we do not deserve salvation. You have to get that in your mind if you want to truly appreciate the gospel of Jesus Christ. None of us deserve salvation. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All are, all are um, deserving of eternal hell. And I know that's not popular to talk about these days. We want to talk about sunshine and rainbows and all kinds of happiness. But I want to tell you something. You will not have true happiness, true joy, true everlasting joy until you understand the gospel. And I would be doing you a disservice by giving you a peppy TED talk and trying to just build up your self-esteem. I would far rather tell you the truth and have you repent and place your faith in Jesus Christ, just like Diane has done this morning. This wonderful thing. The Bible says that there's great rejoicing in heaven by the angels when one sinner repents and places their faith in Christ. So I suspect there's a big party going on in heaven right now. So, I want you to understand. So what shall we say then? So Paul lays forth a profound distinction between the Jews and the Gentiles. And I want you to look at the next part of the verse. So he says, what shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it. That is a righteousness that is by faith. In other words, the Gentiles didn't pursue righteousness and, re and they received it anyway. They didn't receive it through the law because the law was given to the Jewish people. The Jews had a distinct advantage over everyone else. They were given the very oracles of God. That God, God revealed himself to this people, and, and, and they missed it. They missed it entirely. And, and so the Gentiles merely heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. All gospel means is the good news of Jesus Christ, right? And so the gospel of Christ, and without all the background, with all, without all the background of the Jewish life and the Jewish traditions and the understanding of the Old Testament Scripture, they came to saving faith nonetheless. What's the point? Well, first, one does not need to be a Jew to be saved. You don't need to become Jewish in order to become saved. There was some of that heresy going around in the first century church to say, oh yeah, we believe that Jesus Christ is Messiah. We, we buy that. But you've got to understand, in order to have him as Messiah, you need to become a Jew first and go through all the ritualistic processes in order to become a Jew so that you can become a Christian. Now, we're all a bunch of Gentiles. Is there any Jews here? Any Jewish people here? I don't see any. Um, we're all a bunch of Gentiles. Aren't you glad? Aren't you thankful that you don't have to follow the 613 laws that are laid out in the Old Testament so that you can get to the place where you can trust Christ as your Savior and become born again? I'm grateful for that. I couldn't even tell you all 613 laws. I know one of them is don't boil a kid in its mother's milk. That's weird. But it's a law nonetheless that they still follow over in Israel today. It's very interesting. We don't have to do that. And, and we praise God for that. So first things first, you do not need to become a Jew to be saved. Secondly, salvation does not come through one's heritage. Salvation does not come through one's religion. Salvation does not come through someone's knowledge or experience or works or whatever. Righteousness, hear me folks, righteousness is what is necessary for salvation from God's wrath and that righteousness is only obtained by faith. It's only by faith. This, by the way, is the, uh, is the transition verse 
from a focus on God's sovereignty into human responsibility. So we've been walking through Romans chapter 9, which is a real emphasis on the sovereign hand of God. But now in these verses, we're seeing a transition that will take us into Romans 10 and really lay out what our responsibility is and how we, how we respond to the gospel message. And so this is setting us up for that. This is the exercise of faith that brings about righteousness. The Gentiles heard the gospel message. Your sins are forgiven in Christ. Believe and repent, and you will be saved from the wrath of God. That's our biggest problem as, human, in, as humans in humanity. Our biggest problem is the wrath of God. Our biggest problem isn't Satan. Our biggest problem is the wrath of God. And one day, as we've walked through Romans chapter 9, we will see the fact that God will pour His wrath on this earth in a very tangible way. And so God is giving us a fair warning regarding that. And it is this exercise of faith that brings about righteousness which protects us from the wrath of God. The Gentiles heard this message, and they are and they responded, and I would submit to you, responded way more than the Jews. When you look at the book of Acts, the beginning of the book of Acts, the church is largely comprised of, almost exclusively comprised of Jewish people. By the end of the book of Acts, now the gospel is going to the outermost parts of the world, and you are a recipient of Paul's work of bringing the gospel to the outermost parts of the world. We thank God for that. Romans 10, 17 says this, So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. The Gentiles heard the word of Christ and they had faith. The Jewish nation, on the other hand, was given the very, who were given the very oracles of God. God revealed himself in a very special way to these people and yet they rejected, they rejected the message of the gospel. And that's what verse 31 tells us. But that Israel, who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness, did not succeed in reaching that law. Now, that's a little bit hard to understand, and maybe a better translation of this verse would be this. They were pursuing righteousness, uh, or they were pursuing the law for righteousness. They were pursuing the law in order to be righteous. Okay, that's maybe a better understanding of what Paul is writing here. So in other words, the Jews believed that righteousness was attainable by following the law. I can be righteous by what I do. Okay, so there are two potential paths to righteousness. Number one, faith in Christ's finished work on the cross. When we place our faith in Christ, He wraps us or He clothes us in the righteousness of God. And so God looks upon us and sees the righteousness of Christ. That's one path. The other path is not faith in Christ, but faith in yourself. I have what it takes to enter into the, the, uh, the heaven that God has prepared. That's what it boils down to, faith in Christ or faith in self. The Jews pursued a law that would lead to righteousness, and they did not succeed in reaching that law. They thought they would be able to work it out, and it didn't work that way. Righteousness is by faith, not by the works of the law. By the works of the law, the Bible is clear, no flesh will be justified. Let me give you a couple of examples from the Scriptures. In Romans chapter 3, verse 20, it says this, For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in God's sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. What is Paul saying here in Romans chapter 3? One of the purposes of the law is to show you your sin. It's to show you your incapacity to live out the law and that, in fact, you're not a good person. You have broken God's law over and over and over again. That's the top ten that we see in the Old Testament, right? In Exodus, the, the Ten Commandments. Have you ever lied? Have you ever stolen? Have you ever cheated? Right? Have you ever coveted? We can go through all of the ten and we can recognize very quickly that we have transgressed or we have missed the mark over and over and over again. And because we've missed the mark, we are worthy of eternal wrath by God on us. That's the reality that we face. 
For works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. God gave us the law in part to show us just how sinful we are. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, it says this, Yet we know that a person is not justified, in other words, declared to be righteous, by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. Justified, declared righteous. No one. It's not possible. It's not God's plan. The Jews thought that their adherence to the law would save them, but they were wrong. They were dead wrong. They got the message wrong. We cannot get the message wrong, folks. Literally, your eternal destiny hangs in the balance. You have to get the message right. So why does faith please God? Why does faith please God? We understand Hebrews tells us you can't please God apart from faith. So why does faith please God. I thought about that, and in part I think it's because it shows God that you have confidence in Him. You believe what He says is true, and that's pleasing to Him, that you need Him for who He is and what He is capable of. Remember, another word for faith is belief. So what does it mean to believe in Jesus Christ? It's very important that we get this right. So if I'm on a luxury liner that's sinking, I should want to get off the luxury liner and get to safety. If the crew calls out to me and says, the boat's sinking, get into the lifeboat so you can be saved from drowning in the ocean, that's good news in a bad situation. The lifeboat can save me from death. Now I could say, now I know there's a lifeboat and I'm going to but I'm going to take my chances. I, I'm going to stay on the, on the big boat. I'm going to stay on the big boat. I, I'm a little uncomfortable with this idea of the lifeboat. I, I hear what the crew is telling me to do, but I, just, I want to try a different way. I say this, I, I won't, it won't, there won't be another way that will save me, but I'm going to try it nonetheless. I will be choosing not to accept what I know to be true, that the lifeboat can save me, but I want to see if there's another way. And there may be another person who says, well, if the captain says to get on the lifeboat, I'm going to get on the lifeboat, right? There might be that person that says that. So here's the deal. Believing in the Bible is not merely accepting the information. It's not just accepting the information. It's entrusting yourself to the information that you say you accept, in other words, there is no belief until I get on the lifeboat. I can believe that it will save me. I can believe that I need to get on that boat to save me. But until I get my butt on that boat, I'm not exercising belief or faith. Does that make sense? Talking means nothing. I could say, oh, that lifeboat looks, sure looks good. I believe that lifeboat can save somebody. I believe that the lifeboat is, is more than able. I, I believe that the lifeboat is in the wheel of the middle of the wheel, right? If, if you've been around church at all, you know what that means. In the middle of the wheel of the wheel. I, I believe that that lifeboat is so high you can't get over it. It's so low that you can't get under it. I, I believe that it's so wide you can't get around it. I believe that the lifeboat is the Rose of Sharon. It's the Balm of Gilead. And it's the bright and morning star. I believe in that lifeboat. And I could say all of that and still drown in the ocean if I don't get on the lifeboat. I've got to get on the lifeboat. So to tell me that the chair that you're sitting in can hold you up is meaningless until you sit down. It's the sitting down that is the act of faith that equals real faith. Not merely did the discussion about faith. How, how do you know that you've acted in faith? Simple. You reject everything but Christ to save you. you your trust in Christ is all you have. Faith is at the heart of humility. Folks, faith is at the heart of humility. God is so merciful to the humble. James chapter 4, verse 6 says, but he gives more grace. 
Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. He gives grace to the humble. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 and 6, a parallel verse to this, he says, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another. For why? For God opposes the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you. In order for you to be saved, you must be humble and admit that you need saving, and you must admit that you are not capable of saving yourself by what you do. Remember, God is not impressed by you. (gasps) Pastor Mark, that's so rude. I mean, how could you say that? I am obviously a very impressive person. God's not impressed by you. He loves you. He absolutely loves you with an everlasting love. But there's nothing that you can bring to God to say, look what I've done. And he goes, you know, I never thought of that. How'd you come up with that? You're so clever. Not our God. We can't impress him. But he loves us. He loves us with an everlasting love. And he desires for us to be in his family. Listen, do you believe that the Lord God is capable of saving you? Do you believe that he is capable? Just like that lifeboat is capable of saving people. Do you believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is capable of saving you? Do you believe that that if God says something in his word, he's capable of performing it? If you believe that, you must exercise faith and place yourself in Christ. Repent of your sin and place yourself in at the mercy of God in Christ Jesus, and He will gloriously save you. Over the next, over the ne- when we get into Romans 10, we're going to talk about that even more, about God's glorious process of bringing us into His family. Listen, who do you believe in more? You or God? Who do you trust more? You or God? So God's work, not your work, makes you right with Him. Be right with Him, first of all and foremost, by faith. You must place your faith in Him, and that faith calls you to action to pursue Him. Number two, be right with God by avoiding God's offensive rock. What? Be right with God by avoiding God's offensive rock. Now, I'm pretty gifted at tripping over my own two feet. Thank you. I have a witness, or flat carpet for that matter, or whatever. I've been known to trip up the stairs. My wife's like, what happened? I just was a fool and tripped up the stairs. I don't know. As long as I am walking, there are plenty of opportunities for me to stumble over something. Well, there is a rock that many stumble over, a rock that Paul brings to our attention, and we need to decide what to do about this rock. What should we do with this stone of stumbling or this rock of offense that that, uh, is talked about here. Believe me, it's either an offensive rock or it's a rock that you can build your life on. So let's take a look at verses 32 and 33 to see what we can learn about this offensive rock. Okay, Paul says these words. Why? Because they did not pursue it. They, the Jews, did not pursue the law by faith, but as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So why did Israel not succeed in reaching the law or righteousness by the law? Paul says in verse 31 the very reason, because they did not pursue it by faith. They thought it would save them, and they got it all wrong. They thought it was based on works. Again, the law was never intended to save. It was intended to reveal the holy character of God. It was intended to show God's people the impossibility of living out God's law flawlessly. It was intended to point to the only one who could and did live out God's law perfectly and flawlessly. That person, of course, is Jesus Christ. This is all about Christ. Christ has accomplished what you and I could never accomplish. He's he's clear on that. And, and we, need to, we need to follow Him because of it. He is the reasonable sacrifice for our sin because He is perfect, God, very God. He said, I didn't come to destroy the law and the prophets, Jesus said. I came not to destroy the law, 
but to fulfill it. And he did brilliantly. But the law could nor would save anyone from eternal condemnation. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. It says this, For since the law has, is but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifice that are, sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Do you see what the writer of Hebrews is saying here? These sacrifices are never going to make someone perfect. Following the law, following what God has laid out, part of the sacrificial system, is never going to perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, they would not have ceased to be offered since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any conscious of, consciousness of sin. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of the sins every year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. The law does not, the sacrificial system, which is embedded in the law, does not take away sin. Titus echoes this thought in Titus chapter 3, verse 5. He says, He saves us, God saves us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. And this is what Paul is trying to communicate. Paul is, uses uh, to talk about the stone that some people stumble over. What did they not pursue by faith? Quiz, what did they not pursue by faith? The Jews, what did they not pursue by faith? And everyone said, righteousness. They didn't pursue righteousness by faith. What did they pursue as if it were by works? Righteousness. They pursued the law thinking that the law was going to make them righteous. They thought the law would make them righteous, but all the law did was contribute to what? Their self-righteousness. Some questions come to surface as we look at this passage. What's a stumbling stone? What does this imagery mean? Why does God lay a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense? Does God purposely put up a barrier to salvation? What's going on here? Well, Paul takes, in his genius, Paul takes an Old Testament prophet and uses two verses from this Old Testament prophet to argue his case and give us some hope this morning. First is from Isaiah chapter 8 verse 14 and he uses this in a very strategic way to show the two purposes of the stumbling stone and the rock of offense. First I want you to notice that it is God who puts the stumbling stone in Israel. Do you see that? It's God who does that. Okay? The Jews, however, are responsible for stumbling over this stone. So God puts the stone there, and they stumble over it, and they are responsible for stumbling. They should have seen this stone for what it was and what it is and avoided stumbling. The Isaiah 14 passage demonstrates that the Lord Jesus Christ is the stone to strike and the rock to stumble over. This stone is Jesus. Look at Isaiah 14. It says this, And he will become a sanctuary and a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling for both the house of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Do you see this? He, who, the Messiah, Jesus, will cause them to stumble. Okay, so tuck that away. On the other hand, Isaiah 28, 16, which Paul also quotes here, shows that God puts the stone in place as a cornerstone to build on. We sang cornerstone a little earlier, and Jesus Christ is, in fact, the cornerstone to build our lives on. Look at verse 16 of chapter 28. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am the one who, it, who has laid a foundation in Zion, a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not be in haste. They will not be put to shame, as Paul quotes it. So how can the Lord be both the stone itself and yet the one who places the stone in place? Well, the answer, one Theologian answered it this way, the Messiah is the Lord God. By combining the text on judgment with the other text on hope, Paul shows that Christ is the Lord and he is both the hope of salvation for those who build their lives on him and yet at the same time a rock of stumbling and a stone of offense for those who take pride in their own good works. 
The fact is, while Jesus is a safe haven for the believer, that's a great place for an amen. I'm going I'm to come at it again. Okay, Ready? So Jesus is a safe haven for the believer. He is, absolutely. But he is also a stumbling stone for the unbeliever. Check out 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. For the word of the cross is folly, is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where, where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For the Jews demand a sign and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greek, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than man, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. When you preach the gospel to people, and you suggest to them that some guy 2,000 years ago hung on a tree, and that guy can absolve you from your sin, and if you just believe in Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. Do you recognize how foolish that sounds? From the untrained, ungodly ear, but to those of us who are being saved, it's the sweetest words we'll ever hear. Right? We must understand that. The Jews, in particular here, Paul is addressing the Jews. They missed it. They stumbled over it. Why would, this, why would the Lord purposely place a stumbling stone in Zion? Because the message of the gospel is offensive. The message of the gospel is offensive. Why is it offensive? Because it goes after our pride. Whether I care to admit it or not, I am helpless without God. The very breath I breathe is a gift from God. The fact that my body can process oxygen and turn it into something that keeps me alive or food or whatever, it's all because of God. I am helpless without God. Even the unbeliever is preserved by the merciful hand of God. And I would just encourage you, for those in the sound of my voice that are actively rejecting Jesus and the gospel today, please hear me. Hear me. No judgment from me, but please hear me. It is only by God's mercy that you are not in hell right now. Turn to Him before it's too late. Understand that. Praise God. Diane, turn to Him. Right? You can turn to Him today as well. God saves me by His grace and He preserves me by His mercy. I know what I deserve. I know what I deserve. But it's by His grace and mercy that I stand before you today. What do I bring to the table in God's process of salvation? What do I bring? What do I bring to the table? What can I do? The only thing that I bring is the sin that makes my salvation necessary. That's it. I cannot boast in anything because everything I have and everything that I can do is because of the Lord. The only thing that I can boast in is the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 17 says this, Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. We bring nothing to the table. So what does this boil down to for you and me? Christ, the rock, is a stumbling stone for those who believe their righteousness is sufficient for eternal salvation. It's a stumbling stone. So, why? Well, think about it. How could a lowly carpenter be the Messiah? How could a lowly carpenter, an untrained rabbi, be the Messiah? The Messiah, it doesn't make sense, right? How could a crucified Messiah be the King of kings and the Lord of lords? <clears throat> when we were in Israel, our tour guide alone 
that was his biggest barrier to faith. He said he was a pre-Easter believer. In other words, he believed in Jesus, a literal Jesus, but there is no way that a Messiah could be hung on a cross and killed. Not possible. And so he believes in Jesus, but he doesn't believe in Jesus. And my friend alone is not a believer. He's not saved. And the wrath of God remains on him. And he's a Jew. He knows the Bible. He, but but this, is, this, is the, this is the reality for him. How could a lowly carpenter be Messiah? How could, how could a crucified Messiah be the King of kings and the Lord of lords? This is a stumbling block. I, I just can't get past this. What are you talking about? Uh, Charles Simeon, Simeon said this, Any plan of salvation which gives no offense to self-righteous men is certainly not of God. When I became a follower of Christ, I was confronted with the gospel. I recognized through that confrontation I was a sinner, a terrible sinner, a wicked sinner, and I deserved eternal hell. And it was that night that I came to that realization that God gloriously saved me. He had grace upon grace on me. I mean, for years before, but that evening He opened my heart and mind to the reality that I need Christ, and He gloriously saved me. So the stumbling stone no longer was a stumbling stone. He was the one I could build my life on. You have a choice with Jesus. You can either trip over him or build your life upon him. Matthew chapter 7, verses 70, or 24 and 20, through 27 says this, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat that house, but it did not fall because it was founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rains fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was its fall. I don't want your fall to be great. I want you to build your house upon the rock. And I will tell you, when you build your house upon the rock, the winds will come. The winds will blow. The storms will be there. It will be hard. But your house will not fall. Not because of you, but because you built it on the rock. Either way, the stone, the rock, does not move. We have to choose Will I stumble over this rock or will I build my life on it? So will you stumble over Christ on your way to eternal hell? Is it just too much for you to believe that this, this man, if he even existed 2,000 years ago, is capable of cleansing me of my sin and, and providing eternal life for me? That's too much for me to believe. And you stumble. You stumble over the rock as you stumble your way to hell. Or will you build your life on the rock and thus have the promise of eternal life with Christ forever? That's my hope for you. By building your life on the rock, the rock is no longer offensive, but instead life-giving. And, and that's, a, that's a beautiful promise. And, and Paul, quoting Isaiah at the end of these verses, says, But whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. There will be no shame for those that are in Christ Jesus. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. We are free in Christ Jesus. There's great joy in Christ Jesus. The rest of the world may not understand that, but that's okay. You do because of what God has said to you in His Word. So what will you do with Jesus? That's really what this boils down to. What will you do with Jesus? Will you be like the passage I read in 1 Corinthians where the Jews look at Him as a stumbling block and, and you know, the Gentiles look at Him as, this is intellectually inferior for me to even consider Christ. Is that where you're at with this? I hope not. I hope that you open your heart up to the Lord right now and ask Him to save you if you are not saved. If you are saved, I hope you open your heart up to the Lord right now and thank Him for what He's provided for you. What will you do with Jesus? 
How will you answer the question, why should I let you into my heaven? How will you answer that question? Why should I let you into my heaven? The only way to avoid stumbling on the stumbling stone is to build your life on the rock, and that requires faith. You must believe what Jesus says is true. And you must repent of the idea that you can earn your way to heaven and a relationship with God. God's work, not your work, makes you right with Him. So we're right with God by one way and one way alone. Faith. That's it. And we're right with God by avoiding the offensive rock and instead building our life upon it. And I want to encourage you to build your life on the rock. Would you stand up with me? Have a wonderful... We're going to sing this a cappella. All right? This old song is a wonderful song that really echoes... Angie, you can help me out with this. Make sure I start this off right. Uh, this echoes really what we've been talking about the whole time, right? And uh, would you help me? Would you help me with this? Make sure I get it right. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you're starting. Thank you. Would you help me with that? Hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I Dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus. Now lift it up like you mean it. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Do you believe that all other ground? ground is sinking sand. I trust, I pray, and I beg that you would not build your house on the sand, but that you would in fact build your house on the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone, Jesus Christ. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Father, thank you for the privilege that we have to stand on Christ. We don't need to stumble over the stone. We simply need to place our faith in Christ and build on Christ. Oh God, we need that. For those that are here today that do not know you as Savior, I pray that today would be the day where they build their house, their life on the chief cornerstone and that they would stop stumbling over the stone of offense. And Father, for those here today that are followers of Christ who just sang so well that song, On Christ the Solid Rock I Stand, Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts and help us to be the bold Christians that we, we claim to be. We live in a time where Christians need to boldly stand up for their faith, in love, but boldly stand up for their faith, not ashamed, but uh, boldly living for Jesus Christ. So God, help us with these things. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.